The Crawling Chaos by H.P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Crawling Chaos by H.P. Lovecraft Of the pleasures and pains of opium much has been written. The ecstasies and horrors of De Quincey and the paradis artificiels of Baudelaire are preserved and interpreted with an art which makes them immortal. And the world knows well the beauty, the terror, and the mystery of those obscure realms into which the inspired dreamer is transported. But, much as has been told, no man has yet dared intimate the nature of the phantasms thus unfolded to the mind, or hint at the direction of the unheard-of roads along whose ornate and exotic course the partaker of the drug is so irresistibly borne. De Quincey was drawn back into Asia, that teeming land of nebulous shadows whose hideous antiquity is so impressive that Quote, the vast age of the race and name overpowers the sense of youth in the individual, unquote. But farther than that, he dared not go. Those who have gone farther seldom returned, and even when they have, they have been either silent or quite mad. I took opium but once, in the year of the plague, when doctors sought to deaden the agonies they could not cure. There was an overdose. My physician was worn out with horror and exertion. And I traveled very far indeed. In the end, I returned and lived. But my nights are filled with strange memories nor have I ever permitted a doctor to give me opium again. The pain and pounding in my head had been quite unendurable when the drug was administered. Of the future I had no heed. To escape, whether by cure, unconsciousness, or death, was all that concerned me. I was partly delirious so that it is hard to place the exact moment of transition. But I think the effect must have begun shortly before the pounding ceased to be painful. As I have said, there was an overdose, so my reactions were probably far from normal. The sensation of falling, curiously dissociated from the idea of gravity or direction, was paramount though there was subsidiary impression of unseen throngs in incalculable profusion, throngs of infinitely diverse nature, but all more or less related to me. Sometimes it seemed less as though I were falling than as though the universe or the ages were falling past me. Suddenly my pain ceased, and I began to associate the pounding with an external rather than internal force. The falling had ceased also, giving place to a sensation of uneasy, temporary rest, and when I listened closely, I fancied the pounding was that of the vast, inscrutable sea, as its sinister, colossal breakers lacerated some desolate shore after a storm of titanic magnitude. Then I opened my eyes, for a moment, my surroundings seemed confused, like a projected image hopelessly out of focus. But gradually I realized my solitary presence in a strange and beautiful room lighted by many windows. Of the exact nature of the apartment I could form no idea, for my thoughts were still far from settled. But I noticed van-colored rugs and draperies, elaborately fashioned tables, chairs, ottomans, and divans, and delicate vases and ornaments which conveyed a suggestion of the exotic. 
without being actually alien. These things I noticed, yet they were not long uppermost in my mind. Slowly, but inexorably crawling upon my consciousness and rising above every other impression came a dizzying fear of the unknown, a fear all the greater because I could not analyze it, and seeming to concern a stealthily approaching menace, not death, but some nameless, unheard-of thing inexpressibly more ghastly and abhorrent. Presently, I realized that the direct symbol and excitant of my fear was the hideous pounding whose incessant reverberations throbbed maddeningly against my exhausted brain. It seemed to come from a point outside and below the edifice in which I stood, and to associate itself with the most terrifying mental images. I felt that some horrible scene or object lurked beyond the silk-hung walls and shrank from glancing through the arched, latticed windows that opened so bewilderingly on every hand. Perceiving shutters attached to these windows, I closed them all, averting my eyes from the exterior as I did so. Then, employing a flint and steel, which I found on one of the small tables, I lit the many candles reposing about the walls in arabesque sconces. The added sense of security brought by closed shutters and artificial light calmed my nerves to some degree, but I could not shut out the monotonous pounding. Now that I was calmer, the sound became as fascinating as it was fearful and I felt a contradictory desire to seek out its source despite my still powerful shrinking. Opening a portiere at the side of the room nearest the pounding, I beheld a small and richly draped corridor ending in a cavern door and large oriel window. To this window I was irresistibly drawn though my ill-defined apprehensions seemed almost equally bent on holding me back. As I approached it, I could see a chaotic whirl of waters in the distance. Then, as I attained it and glanced out on all sides, the stupendous picture of my surroundings burst upon me with full and devastating force. I beheld such a sight as I had never beheld before and which no living person can have seen, save in the delirium of fever, or the inferno of opium. The building stood on a narrow point of land, or what was now a narrow point of land, fully three hundred feet above what must lately have been a seething vortex of mad waters. On either side of the house there fell a newly washed-out precipice of red earth, whilst ahead of me the hideous waves were still rolling in frightfully, eating away the land with ghastly monotony and deliberation. Out a mile or more there rose and fell menacing breakers at least fifty feet in height, and on the far horizon ghoulish black clouds of grotesque contour were resting and brooding, like unwholesome vultures. The waves were dark and purplish almost black, and clutched at the yielding red mud of the bank as if with uncouth, greedy hands. I could not but feel that some noxious marine mind had declared a war of extermination upon all the solid ground, perhaps abetted by the angry sky. Recovering at length from the stupor into which this unnatural spectacle had thrown me, I realized that my actual physical danger was acute. Even whilst I gazed, the bank had lost many feet, and it could not be long before the house would fall, undermined, into the awful pit of lashing waves. Accordingly, I hastened to the opposite side of the edifice, and, finding a door, emerged at once, locking it after me with a curious key which had hung inside. I now beheld more of the strange region about me, and marked a singular division which seemed to exist in the hostile ocean and firmament. On each side of the jutting promontory, different conditions held sway. At my left, as I faced inland, 
was a gently heaving sea with great green waves rolling peacefully in under a brightly shining sun. Something about that sun's nature and position made me shudder, but I could not then tell and cannot tell now what it was. At my right also was the sea, but it was blue, calm, and only gently undulating, while the sky above it was darker, and the washed-out bank more nearly white than reddish. I now turned my attention to the land, and found occasion for fresh surprise, for the vegetation resembled nothing I had ever seen or read about. It was apparently tropical, or at least subtropical, a conclusion borne out by the intense heat of the air. Sometimes I thought I could trace strange analogies with the flora of my native land, fancying that the well-known plants and shrubs might assume such forms under a radical change of climate. But the gigantic and omnipresent palm trees were plainly foreign. The house I had just left was very small, hardly more than a cottage, but its material was evidently marble, and its architecture was weird and composite, involving a quaint fusion of western and eastern forms. At the corners were Corinthian columns, but the red tile roof was like that of a Chinese pagoda. From the door inland there stretched a path of singularly white sand, about four feet wide, and lined on either side with stately palms and unidentifiable flowering shrubs and plants. It lay toward the side of the promontory, where the sea was blue and the bank rather whitish. Down this path I felt impelled to flee, as if pursued by some malignant spirit from the pounding ocean. At first it was slightly uphill, then I reached a gentle crest. Behind me I saw the scene I had left, the entire point with the cottage and the black water, with the green sea on one side and the blue sea on the other, and a curse unnamed and unnameable, lowering over all. I never saw it again, and often wonder. After this last look I strode ahead and surveyed the inland panorama before me. The path, as I have intimated, ran across the right-hand shore as one went inland, Ahead and to the left I now viewed a magnificent valley comprising thousands of acres and covered with a swaying growth of tropical grass higher than my head. Almost at the limit of vision was a colossal palm tree which seemed to fascinate and beckon me. By this time, wonder and escape from the imperiled peninsula had largely dissipated my fear. But as I paused and sank, fatigued to the path, idly digging with my hands into the warm, whitish, golden sand, a new and acute sense of danger seized me. Some terror in the swishing tall grass seemed added to that of the diabolically pounding sea, and I started up crying loudly and disjointedly, Tiger! Tiger! Is it... Tiger? Beast? Beast? Is it a beast that I'm afraid of? My mind wandered back to an ancient and classical story of tigers which I had read. I strove to recall the author, but had difficulty. Then, in the midst of my fear, I remembered that the tale was by Rudyard Kipling. Nor did the grotesqueness of deeming him an ancient author occur to me. I wished for the volume containing the story and had almost started back toward the doomed cottage to procure it when my better sense and the lure of the palm prevented me. Whether or not I could have resisted the backward beckoning, 
Without the counter-fascination of the vast palm tree, I do not know. This attraction was now dominant, and I left the path and crawled on hands and knees down the valley's slope. Despite my fear of the grass and of the serpents it might contain, I resolved to fight for life and reason as long as possible against all menaces of sea or land. Though I sometimes feared defeat, as the maddening swish of the uncanny grasses joined the still audible and irritating pounding of the distant breakers. I would frequently pause and put my hands to my ears for relief, but could never quite shut out the detestable sound. It was, as it seemed to me, only after ages that I finally dragged myself to the beckoning palm tree and lay quiet beneath its protecting shade. There now ensued a series of incidents which transported me to the opposite extremes of ecstasy and horror, incidents which I trembled to recall and dare not seek to interpret. No sooner had I crawled beneath the overhanging foliage of the palm than there dropped from its branches a young child of such beauty as I never beheld before. Though ragged and dusty, this being bore the features of a fawn or demigod, and seemed almost to diffuse a radiance in the dense shadow of the tree. It smiled and extended its hand, but before I could arise and speak I heard in the upper air the exquisite melody of singing. Notes high and low blent with a sublime and ethereal harmoniousness. The sun had by this time sunk below the horizon, and in the twilight I saw an aureole of lambent light encircled the child's head. Then in a tone of silver it addressed me. It is the end. They have come down through the gloaming from the stars. Now all is over, and beyond the Aranurian streams we shall dwell blissfully in Teloi. As the child spoke, I beheld a soft radiance through the leaves of the palm tree, and, rising, greeted a pair whom I knew to be the chief singers among those I had heard. A god and goddess they must have been, for such beauty is not mortal. And they took my hands, saying, Come, child, you have heard the voices, and all is well. In Teloi, beyond the Milky Way, and the Aranurian streams, are cities, all of amber and chalcedony. And upon their domes of many facets glisten the images of strange and beautiful stars. Under the ivory bridges of Teloi flow rivers of liquid gold, bearing pleasure barges bound for blossomy Cytherian of the Seven Suns. And in Teloi and Cytherian abide only youth, beauty, and pleasure, nor are any sounds heard save of laughter, song, and the lute. Only the gods dwell in Teloi of the golden rivers, but among them shalt thou dwell. As I listened enchanted, I suddenly became aware of a change in my surroundings. The palm tree, so lately overshadowing my exhausted form, was now some distance to my left, and considerably below me. I was obviously floating in the atmosphere, companioned not only by the strange child and the radiant pair, but by a constantly increasing throng of half-luminous, vine-crowded youths and maidens with wind-blown hair and joyful countenance. We slowly ascended together, as if borne on a fragrant breeze which blew not from the earth but from the golden nebulae, and the child whispered in my ear that I must look always upward to the pathways of light and never backward to the sphere I had just left.
The youths and maidens now chanted mellifluous choriambics to the accompaniment of lutes, and I felt enveloped in a peace and happiness more profound than any I had in life imagined when the intrusion of a single sound alerted my destiny and shattered my soul. Through the ravishing strains of the singers and the lutenists, as if in mocking, demonic concord throbbed from gulfs below the damnable, the detestable pounding of that hideous ocean. As those black breakers beat their message into my ears, I forgot the words of the child, and looked back down upon the doomed scene from which I thought I had escaped. Down through the ether, I saw the accursed earth slowly turning, ever turning, with angry and tempestuous seas gnawing at wild, desolate shores and dashing foam against the tottering towers of deserted cities and under a ghastly moon there gleamed sights I can never describe, sights I can never forget. Deserts of corpse-like clay and jungles of ruin and decadence where once stretched the populous plains and villages of my native land, and maelstroms of frothing ocean where once rose the mighty temples of my forefathers. Round the northern pole steamed a morass of noisome growths and miasmal vapors, hissing before the onslaught of the ever-mounting waves that curled and fretted from the shuttering deep. Then a rending report clave the night, and athwart the desert of deserts appeared a smoking rift. Still the black ocean foamed and gnawed, eating away the desert on either side as the rift in the center widened and widened. There was now no land left but the desert, and still the fuming ocean ate and ate. All at once I thought even the pounding sea seemed afraid of something, afraid of the dark gods of the inner earth that are greater than the evil god of waters. But even if it was, it could not turn back, and the desert had suffered too much from those nightmare waves to help them now. So the ocean ate the last of the land and poured into the smoking gulf, thereby giving up all it had ever conquered. From the new flooded lands it flowed again, uncovering death and decay and from its ancient and immemorial bed it trickled loathsomely, uncovering nighted secrets of the years when time was young and the gods unborn. Above the waves rose weedy remembered spires. The moon laid pale lilies of light on dead London, and Paris stood up from its damp grave to be sanctified with stardust. Then rose spires and monoliths that were weedy but not remembered. Terrible spires and monoliths of lands that men never knew were lands. There was not any pounding now, but only the unearthly roaring and hissing of waters tumbling into the rift. The smoke of that rift had changed to steam and almost hit the world as it grew denser and denser. It seared my face and hands, and when I looked to see how it affected my companions, I found they had all disappeared. Then, very suddenly, it ended, and I knew no more till I awaked upon a bed of convalescence. As the cloud of steam from the plutonic gulf finally concealed the entire surface from my sight, all the firmament shrieked at a sudden agony of mad reverberations which shook the trembling ether. In one delirious flash and burst it happened, one blinding, deafening holocaust of fire, smoke, and thunder that dissolved the wan moon as it sped outward to the void. And when the smoke cleared away, and I sought to look upon the earth, I beheld against the background of cold, humorous stars, 
only the dying sun and the pale, mournful planets searching for their sister. End of The Crawling Chaos by H.P. Lovecraft This recording is in the public domain.